Yes, good evening, I'm Caroline Crawford from Pequot Library, and I welcome everyone to the first Meet the Author of 2021. On behalf of Executive Director Stephanie Coakley, the Board of Trustees, the staff, we appreciate everyone's patience and generosity and support throughout these tumultuous uh, last, we're going on 10 months. Um, we are in for an all-star awesome evening. Um, we are so psyched to have Rich Cohen, New York Times, five times best-selling author, a contributor to so many magazines, uh, lives in Richfield with his family, a hockey devotee, and just a great guy. And uh, we're thrilled to have him here. Thank you for being here. And we have Deb Placey, who is a neighbor of the libraries, who's been a sportscaster for over 25 years. She's most recently on uh, NFL uh, Suite. Is that what it's called? Uh, the NHL Executive Suite. Yeah, it's a podcast I've been doing. Which is so cool. We appreciate that. And she's an avid tennis player, a uh, competitive equestrian, a neighbor. When she's not doing all these amazing things, she is with uh, Pink Aid, which, she, which gives support to women uh, with financial issues and breast cancer. And we're psyched. We, um, we open up questions. Uh, there's, a question, there's a chat and a Q&A, so you can all throw your questions there. Deb and Rich will be speaking for about 30 minutes. Again, my apologies for the uh, delayed start. We had some technical issues, but throw your questions out there. And on behalf of Pequot Library, Rich and Deb, thank you so much for being here. Oh, and uh, just so you know, books can be purchased through finleysfiction.com. She's a local indie bookseller and she's awesome as well. So over to you guys. Thank you so much for being here. Well, thank you so much for having us. I, um, it would not be 2020 without a little bit of something to start us off with. Though, even though it's 21, I think it's all okay. Everyone, you know, is pretty patient uh, in these trying times. Um, thank you so much for asking me to be here. Uh, I am somewhat of a hockey mom, um, except that the hockey players I covered were professionals. Um, but as a sports parent, and as so many of you, I'm sure, uh, who have um, joined us here tonight, we're so pleased to have you, our sports parents yourselves. This this is a must read. It's uh, Rich Cohen's Pee Wee's Confessions of, uh, a, of a Hockey Parent. And I think that hockey relates to so many sports and so many activities that kids play. So we'll get right into it. It is a year in the life. So Rich, the first question is, when did you decide that you were going to write this book as you started the season? Um. I think that basically when my son started really getting more serious about hockey around squirts, I started like, I started to realize that I was kind of losing control of my own emotions. You know, I was getting so caught up. It was like an experience I hadn't felt since following the Cubs in 1984. It was that kind of up and down. And, um, and I was really upset. And I think my brother might be watching it because I would call him up and he would tell me to get, that I'd get it together, you know? And um, when that happens, I usually kind of look for a book or a movie or some kind of guide. And I went looking around for something and I felt like it didn't exist. You know, I felt like it didn't exist. So I decided to write it. And then, um, you know, then the material is so great because it's, it's really about being a parent, but it's just intensified and amplified by the experience of hockey. But it's just the reason why it's so intense is because it's just about being a parent. So, so your son who is one of the characters in the book and really obviously a big part of it. Give Just for some perspective for our audience, how old are you when you're a squirt? Uh, you are, let me think. So in this book, it's 11 and 12 is the peewee, so uh, nine and 10. So that's really the, the best place to start as in your own words, you are losing your mind as your right. nine year old played hockey, right? Yeah, I mean, it sort of How starts- How is that with, not with, fertile for a book? <laughs> Yeah. And also, you know, I, I tend to find that the things I get really obsessed on, like, there's all these things I care about in my life. And then I suddenly realize I didn't care about anything but this. You know what I mean? Like, and, and I have three other kids, man. So I'm like, I'm being a bad parent. I'm giving a really bad example to my other kids because I seem to only be concerned with what one of them is doing. And my father is, has this saying where, and I put it at the beginning of the book, he says, the key to life is to care, but not that much. And I found myself violating and breaking that rule all the time and the coaches in our organization and all these organizations have a rule which would be good to apply to every kind of life which is the 24-hour rule which is you're not allowed to talk to the coach about what happened in the game 
for 24 hours after the game is over, by which time presumably tempers would have cooled. And, but I found myself routinely breaking the 24 hour rule. So I knew that I was a sick person that needed help. And so I wrote the book for myself. So there are other some people in my condition. Wonderful lessons for parents and kids in the book, but also lots of comic relief. Um, it's so rich in its writing, um, which I guess is a plan words. Um, we're, the one thing I want to um, bring up to also get going is um, the characters in the book, the, the, the players, the, the parents, the coaches, some of whom are parents as well. And all their names and jobs have been changed <laughs> to protect the innocent, or I guess the guilty in some cases. So one thing I was thinking of to ask you as I was reading it was, do these folks know who they are now that they may have read it? And, and did you think of that in the back of your mind as you were describing them in vivid detail and their behavior, good and bad, that they would know that they would recognize themselves in the book? Well, it's sort of like a paper mache where as you change it and change it and change it, the original model, the original wire thing behind it all becomes unrecognizable to the point where by, by the time I was finished, um, I, uh, couldn't rec I couldn't even remember half the time. And when people say that I know this person is this person or this person is that person, I always say, you might think you know, but you'll probably be wrong. Of course, that could just be something I'm saying to further protect myself. But um, basically, and, and then the other thing, you know, when you change the names, like the names are so much a part of people's identity that when you change the names, you just think about it differently. Now, here's another thing, which is I have a lot of friends I grew up with. I'm still really close friends with in Illinois. And they always say they read all my books, okay? But I don't believe them. I think that they're lying. So basically, most of the names that I've added here are names of kids I grew up with. And they're all telling me that they love the book, but they're not mentioning that they're in the book, you know? <laughs> they don't <laughs> so it serves a dual function. So one thing about the team, and I thought if it was, uh, first of all, tell, tell us how you ended up in Ridgefield. I know you were born in Chicago uh, and played youth hockey yourself. How did you end up in Ridgefield and in this town, which is such an integral part of the book, your neighbors, the way the town is, um, in addition to this cast of characters that come from all walks of life that end up on this team with the common denominator, or I guess the great equalizer being the abilities of your kids? Um, I should say that I think Ridgefield is like the greatest place I've ever lived and I love it. And, but I found it completely by accident, which is, I don't know the suburbs of New York or Connecticut. I just, cause I didn't grow up here. And, um, and I was, I was living in the city and I, and I sort of, all of a sudden I say procreated myself out of the city. I thought I bought this apartment on 110th street. That was, I thought this place is so big. I'll live here till I die. It was 700 square feet or something. <laughs> <laughs> and then I quickly had three kids. One of the kids was convinced the other kid's bedroom was our bathroom. So I'm like, we got to get out of here. And we, well, I was looking in Montclair, New Jersey, because I had friends that lived there. And every time I made an offer on a house, uh, there was a bidding war and I lost the house. And finally, I said, let's just offer what they're asking for. And the person that I made the offer to counteroffered on their own asking price. Basically, I violated one of my father's negotiating rules. But um, so I'm like, you know what, the hell with this place. And we'd seen a house on a website in Connecticut. It looks so beautiful. I'm like, let's just go up there. And we came up here and bought it. And, and I remember the day we drove up, and then we just drove up here knowing nothing. And the day we drove up was one of those weird days. We left in August, and we got here like the weather had dropped 20 degrees. It seemed like fall. And I saw Red Sox flags everywhere. And I'm like, where am I? You know, because I thought I was moving to a suburb of New York and somehow I'm like in Medford Mass. That was my feeling. So, but then it turns out that just coincidentally, this house that I bought is like a quarter mile from a hockey rink. So I'm like, I might be done with the game, but the game's not done with me. I can hear it calling, you know? And that's a weird thing. Like I'm a Gen X person, like maybe you are. So all this stuff that was with me in different points of my life has followed me out here. So there's a playhouse here where like squeeze plays and like all those bands are, are, they're all right by my house. So that is, I ended up here completely by chance, completely by good luck. It's one of the lucky things that's happened to me. So just like in Connecticut, you're just as likely to run, you know, to, to run into Steve Cohen who just bought the Mets at the, at the, you know, at Starbucks as you are to have, you know, like I, I passed my neighbor three doors down 
uh, every day who has had silver duct tape on her mailbox to keep it from falling off the post because uh, it might cost ten dollars to fix it for the last fifteen years. This this team of yours, you know, comes from you know every socioeconomic background and type of vehicle, which you saw, I guess, in the parking lot, which was your first introduction to all the different players, you know, literally that that you'd be dealing with all year. Yeah, well, I should say, because you made me laugh, because my brother might, or my sister-in-law for sure is watching, my brother's also named Steve Cohen. So, I, and when Steve Cohen was buying the Mets, the coach, this is not a team in the book, this happened after I finished the book, said to me basically, hey, um, we're thinking of moving Mike up to, uh, you know, the power play in the top line. Um, is your brother the guy buying the Mets? Oh. <laughs> I was like, no. He's like, yeah, no, that power play is pretty much set. I'm sorry. <laughs> So, um, yeah, I mean, like a big, at uh, one point, like, you know, when you watch all this stuff about, you know, the tryouts are very intense. They're like a childhood version of the NFL combine. That's what it looks like to me. And, they, you know, kids with numbers and they're running through all these drills and all these parents are depressed to the glass watching them like sharks in an aquarium. And I, I'm like, I got, I got to get some air, man. So I went outside, I'm sitting in the parking lot and I really looked at the parking lot for the first time. And I noticed how weird this parking lot is because you have, you know, Teslas and Lamborghinis and like hundred thousand dollar cars. And then you have beat up old held together by duct tape pickup trucks. And so hockey is really this incredible, you know, cross of different economic circumstances because it's a game that draws from all these different areas and they all end up together on the ice. So when you, when your kid plays on a travel team, you spend more time with the other parents than you have with anybody since college, since a dorm, you know? And so you have this kind of really interesting mix of people that are doing different things in their lives. And it's actually one of the really great things about hockey are the other parents who, you know, whatever happens, but they become your best friends. They have to, you're with them all the time. So as you, um, look back on on some of the things you wrote and as you reread it and and what you want your readers to get out of it as well as being entertained because it you know clearly there's um a, a lot of funny stuff and a lot of things that everyone will relate to um what is your take now that you look back on the year that that you hope that readers will get out of the book you are not alone you know like you are not crazy <laughs> like your sense that this that this is an extreme situation and then you're feeling like I'm just something wrong with me it's not you it is actually a pretty pretty weird situation that you find yourself in and that it's amazing a very gratifying thing the book's only been out for a couple of weeks is that I've been hearing getting long emails from people and coaches see it's interesting for coaches because a lot of coaches said we didn't really know what it's like for the parents uh -huh. I would say to the coaches like I know you have to deal with a lot of crazy parents but be kind when you deal with us like approach a parent as if you're approaching somebody that's had two or three drinks. We're not normally like this. <laughs> it's just that we're kind of drunk on this experience of being a hockey parent. It's not our fault. We're normally very normal and wouldn't and realize that da, 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 but we're, you got us at a weird moment. Is there something particular to hockey that, that makes uh, for this reaction or do you think it's similar or can be similar to other sports or is it maybe a combination? Well, I think it's a combination. I mean, I think what is particular to hockey is, and one of the great things about hockey is the plexiglass and the fact that the players are on a different surface. The plexiglass is protecting the kids from the parents is how I see it. Like no parent can run out on the ice, which I've seen happen in a Little League baseball game where a parent ran out on the field to yell at the umpire. That kind of thing can't happen. And you can, as a kid, even remembering from my own time, you can tune out the parents because they're, it's just a wash of noise, you know? and um, and so all that is unique about hockey and the fact that hockey is a heavy, heavy commitment. You might play 80 games. It's expensive, you know, and it's a lot of time away from home and a lot of time of driving. And that's sort of unique. You know, other sports have become more like it, like baseball. They have travel baseball more and everything than when I was a kid. But hockey's been like that. And but but the but the basic thing is it's still the same because it's still parents and kids and all the status and tension and all the stuff that goes in with it. My other son used to watch a show, Dance Moms, all the time. And I thought, that's ah, the same thing, man. Dance Moms, Cheerleader Moms, Football Moms, Football Dads, Dance Dads, whatever. It's all, it's all parents under pressure acting like people under pressure. So the, uh, some of the you know, fun in the book and the comic relief comes from you know, text back and forth and you know, the self-realization, what am I doing? But there's also some 
you've really touched on some of the real deep uh, societal things that sort of the societal shifts that at least I took from the book that I really wanted to ask you about, including this social hierarchy that you just mentioned, and that your status, you know, for the year is somehow determined and your social uh, status is determined by which of the teams that your son or daughter makes. I heard something really interesting during quarantine, so I wish I could give somebody credit because I don't know where I read it or saw it, but they were talking about how in our grandparents' day, your social status was maybe a color TV or, you know, a second car, you know, the first Cadillac on the street. And somehow 40 or 50 years later, our uh, status as parents, the pressure has somehow been transferred to our kids and we somehow take status from what college they get into or if they made the travel team or if they wanted a horse show or if they made the, you know, they're a star on the soccer team. And we somehow have brought our, you know, roped our kids in to you know, to fulfill, you know, what kind of status we have. And I just think your book touches on it incredibly well. Well, thank you. I mean, I had this realization, which is before I, I, I had this realization that I, the cliche is sort of like that the reason why parents act, go overboard and all this is because they're, they're, they're trying to relive their own glory days or they're trying to be their, their kid to be the player they never were. And it's all about reliving their past or where their past went wrong. And I didn't really find that to be the case, even though I thought that when I got out there, I realized when your kid does better, you're treated better right now. It's not about the past. It's about the present. And I've had games where my son had a good goal and a stranger came up and hugged me and it felt great, you know, and if you're and the, the it's like the junior high lunchroom where we have four, a lot of these have four teams and double A team and A team and A1 team and a B team. That's a tremendous amount of stratification and which team you're on to some degree presents your status and these people self sort like uh, uh, I'm an A, I'm an, we're on, we are on the A team. We hope to be on the double A team, but we are on the A team. You're not on any team, you know, you're just, the, it's, and it, it really becomes all this stuff. And then it becomes hugely important what team your kid makes stuff that would not have mattered to our parents. They wouldn't have known about it. And, um, and so then it becomes all these issues with getting special lessons and getting, uh, special time and how much ice time and for me another this is with my older son who stopped playing was he was having some trouble as like a sport mastering a few skating skills and um, I was asking other parents like well what should we do I mean he I don't know he's having trouble making this step and they could say oh let him go in his own time he'll figure it out you can't push it there's nothing you could do it's up to him it's not up to you all sounded sensible but finally I'm like you know what maybe I should get him a skating teacher so I very quietly called another rank and I went over there to get him a lesson and all the parents were there getting their private lessons and nobody had told me, you know? So, and it's not like I went, then went and told everybody else either. Now I was in on the secret. I'm not better than anybody else. I did the same exact thing. But the point is that all this stuff seems important in a way it, it didn't. And to me, I always think that there's this huge change in America that you could see in movies, um, which is if you watch the old sports movies like uh, Lou Gehrig, Pride of the Yankees or the Newt Rockney All-American, those kids, when their kids are seen as having to sneak out to play sports, like they're forbidden because it's a waste of time. They right. have to be doing schoolwork. And right. New Rockney's going out and he's like rips his shirt and his mom's like, were you playing football? <laughs> and like he's in big, big trouble. And now if you don't play football, you're in big, big right. trouble, you know? And I always think the turning point is from Lou Gehrig's mother to Mickey Mantle's father, who's, you know, became obsessed with his son making, being the best baseball player of all time and w making him throw a million pitches. And then you throw in the more recent thing, which happened before I got here was that Malcolm Gladwell book outliers that seem to give people a formula of how to make your kid a great athlete, which is 10,000 hours of practice specialization, you know, and making sure you're the oldest kid on the team. So you get the most attention from coaches because you're the most developed. And what you what Malcolm Gladwell doesn't tell you is you can practice for 10 hours and still be terrible at something, you know, doesn't necessarily make you good. <laughs> <laughs> so in the New York Times book review uh, along these lines, I, this, I, I wanted to read this. There's a, a part of the book review. Um, the quote is, there is little to match the intoxication of seeing your child do something well. And that struck me as, um, you know, as you're, you're writing in the book, you're somehow, uh, uh, parents are somehow reeled in. You know, is that what you know? Is that why you're there to you know because it's intoxicating to see them do something well? Yeah, I mean, 
I probably, this is probably a thing that no, we never talk about and I probably shouldn't even say, but you know, when my son, he, look, he's not a great hockey player. He's not going to play college hockey at the NHL, but he's a good hockey player at his level that he plays at, which is a pretty high level here. And um, when he makes a play or something, like when I first saw that, it was like so exciting. You know, I hadn't really felt an excitement about that since, honestly, it's embarrassing to say, but since the 1985 Chicago Bears, you know, I mean, it's like, but every, your kid is the entire Bears team. I mean, it's so it's like a dopamine rush. And then you want your kid to be better and better. So you could feel that again and again and again. And then it becomes like chasing a high. And then when your kid struggles, which they're going to struggle, I mean, they're going to struggle. Then you get kind of mad at the coach and you get mad at the other parents. And you're, cause it's, you're, you're like, that's what I mean. Like three drinks. You're like something like chasing this thing, which you've got to have and your kids got to give you. And it's just, an, and then you're like, what am I doing? You know? And then you write a book called people. <laughs> oh. Um, not to put you on the spot, I, I wanted to re you to read a little bit of. I wanted to you to read a little bit of the Mark Messier. Um, do you have the Do you have the book in front of you? Uh, no, but I can't grab it. Wait. All right, he's going to grab it for um, anyone in the uh, audience who um, isn't totally familiar with Mark Messier. He's the only uh, player in NHL history to have captained two different teams to the Stanley Cup. That's the kind of leader he is. He's a five-time Stanley Cup winner who um, famously played with Wayne Gretzky and Adam Graves at Edmonton, then, of course, came to New York and won the Rangers their first Stanley Cup um, in however more than 50 years. And he is a hockey dad <laughs> and settled and lived in Greenwich and in Connecticut all the years he was playing with the Rangers. And there's a portion of the book that um, he ends up as the opposing coach uh, to uh, our favorite author, Rich Cohn. And mm -hmm. I love how you describe how he looks. And I wanted to, um, to have you read, um, and uh, I can find it. Um, I have it. Okay. This this read a little bit um, about that, ex about how you describe what it was like for you to coach against him. And then you can really, I want you to tell us the story of how it ended after the celebration of your, of your player. Yeah. Not to give too much of the book away. All right. So, um, okay. Near the end of Aaron's hockey career, this is my older son. Uh, we played in a tournament in West Hartford, a Sunday in November, the worst time of year. The leaves had fallen, the highways were black. The parents sat in the locker room with their kids before the last game, bullshitting. They chatted as they filed out, men swaggering in flannel. Then they filed back in, only now quiet and pale. Something terrible had happened. What's going on, I asked. Do you know who's coaching the other team? No, who? Messier. Mark Messier played in the NHL from 1979 to 2004. He's one of the best forwards in history. A Gordie Howe-like all-star who, like Gordie Howe, could score, assist, and brawl. He'd been a champion and a captain in Edmonton and New York. In 1994, when the Rangers faced elimination in Game 6 of the Stanley Cup semifinals, Messier guaranteed victory, then backed it up by scoring three times in the third period against the New Jersey Devils. It was not just how Messier played that intimidated people, but the way he looked. He has high cheekbones and dark almond-shaped eyes and chiseled features. Even in repose, he seems to be glowering. He can't <laughs> help it. It's his face. He did not mess around with the puck when he played. No dipsy doodle for the captain. When he got the puck, he went to the net by the shortest route possible. He never last lost sight of the game's essential object to score more goals. He collected 43 points in his last season when he was 43 years old. He slimmed down since retirement, was bald, tall and handsome, but still 100% Messier. He'd established a youth hockey program in Greenwich, Connecticut, where his son played. He was presumably coaching for the same reason as me, togetherness. We scored three goals in the first period, building a lead that seemed insurmountable. I looked over at Messier, he looked back, he was wearing jeans and a long black coat and nodded. By God, he nodded. <laughs> I love that he nodded. <laughs> So here you are coaching against Messier and then uh, fast forward to uh, the game turned when one of your players celebrated a little too much and tell us the story, uh, including the scene in the parking lot after. I don't want to give away too much of the book, but I'm going to have you give away this. Well, so basically, um, you know, I think that they weren't taking the game real seriously. I mean, I think that they were playing down. So they were looking back on it. So they were letting some of their, 
not so good players play and players play out of position and we were winning and I called my wife from the bench and he said, we're going to beat Mark. I'm going to beat Mark Messier. And you're not, you know, you're not supposed to use cell phones from the bench, but I couldn't help it. And then we, a kid got a goal, putting us, giving us a substantial lead. And he did like an outrageous celebration where he kind of used up the entire ice. It was like a, you know, it was like a, uh, Figure skating Point your finger, and, you know, like pointing his finger at everyone at the bench, giving the go up to God, going down on one knee, shooting a gun, <laughs> like everything you could think of, he did. And you could see it was pissing off everybody. And even I was ashamed of it. And you couldn't stop him, you know. He was out of control. And then Messier called the timeout. I said he made a few adjustments, basically. And a kid that wasn't playing suddenly went into the game. And his own son, who I think had been playing defense, moved up to center. And then they quickly, like, ran up. We, had, we lost, like, 12 to 4, you know. <laughs> and it was – and then after the game, all the parents who normally would be pissed off were just so thrilled to have been up there like, wasn't that a great game, Mr. Messier? Mr. Messier, is it really about how you – not really about who wins and loses, is it, Mr. Messier? You know, and um, you can see how weird his life must be everywhere he yeah. goes. And then we're at Sunday night. We're in West Hartford. It's like pitch black. It's like four in the afternoon. And it's dark. It's cold. And my son's sitting in the car, and I'm trying to fit everything in the back of my Honda Odyssey. You know, like the bag keeps falling back out. I'm trying to get the sticks in. And this little car, I can feel it's like a foot off the ground, a very, like a rocket ship. I can feel it humming <laughs> next to me. And I'm like, what is this? Like super fancy car. And I turn around, and it's Messier and his son. And he looks at me, and he gives me the peace sign, you know? Like, like the coolest thing in the world, you know, the peace sign. And, um, and then he drives away, and I'm like, God damn it. And I went into my son, and I'm like, you know who that was? And he's like, who? I'm like, that was the coolest person in the world to see who that was. <laughs> <laughs> and what's so meaningful as you tie a ribbon in it, 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 and it's really toward the beginning of the book still, so there's much discussion to be had, is you, you took it a step further and looked at it like those parents who were starstruck must have said to themselves, you know, all the pushing of getting my kid into this program and at this level onto this team, even though he's only 12, um, I must be doing something right. Cause here I am, my path has led me to the same place that Mark Messier is a right. dad led him. So it was just such a, you know, an interesting moment in the year. Yeah. It's like, and it's not only about their kids, but me, like I did all this with my life. I made these decisions. I married this person. I moved to this town, but look where I am now. I'm in the Mark, Mark Messier and I, who's like the Fonz, you know, are basically living in the same place at the same moment, validating every one of those decisions. Everything I've done was right, because look where I am. Amazing. And uh, one last thing, and, I, and, and we're going to, um, we want to take some questions from, um, we're getting these wonderful comments. Um, uh, take some questions from, from uh, those who have joined. So glad to have you all um, listening to Rich Cohen talk about this amazing book, Confessions of a Hockey Parent, Pee Wee. Um, and I already forgot what I was just going to ask you about. Um, <laughs> um, uh, I, I'm, I'm wondering how we take questions. Can we take them from the, um, from the chat? I can see them. Oh, Caroline. Yes. Um, Hi. I'm, yeah. I'm, so there's all I there's remember four. what I wanted to ask last. Oh, you can go ahead. Cause we can answer the questions. There's a chat. There's the chat bar. Hmm. What about movie rights? Would you be interested now for, um, I, in 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 um, looking up a little bit about your background, I do know that you've had um, a, such an you know interesting career, and that you've also crossed paths and worked with Martin Scorsese on an HBO, uh, a little uh, dabbling in Hollywood. Would you uh, would you have you been approached at, uh, for movie rights to this? Yeah, I've been talking about really. It. Yeah, I mean, I, I don't think you know. I love watching sports stuff on TV that isn't incredibly heavy and is funny. You know, um, so. And there's been some good stuff lately, like even like Cobra Kai. I don't know if you've watched that show. It's the Karate Kid sequel. It's awesome, you know. So, um, and we and I we've been talking about it, and you know, it's so hard to get any any of that stuff made. But I, I would it would be great, and I think it's great material. And you know, one of the to me one of the greatest movies ever made. And I always look at the American Film Institute's top hundred movies ever made, and it's like The Searchers and or uh, Citizen Kane. I'm always looking for the bad news bears because I think it belongs there, you know, and it never makes totally. itself. As, as a big fan of those movies, um, I would love that, you know, hopefully we can do something. That'd be amazing. We have a question from Mike McCreesh. He wants us to, he asks, is it still the case that an unrealistic percentage of parents think their child has a real path to the NHL? Yes, 
it is still the case. I mean, <laughs> see, but that's like a funny thing because this is like one of my big criticisms of the exper experience, which is that everyone is so focused on where's my kid going to be next year? What team are they going to make next year? And everybody's so afraid of not even, it's not about what team am I going to make. It's the fear of being left behind. And that's something about America. Like it seems so competitive and so tough and so much everyone's out for themselves. And the, even the tryouts, which are like, if a kid's a little bit lagging behind his teammates, the kid gets thrown back, you know, even though we all develop slightly differently. So um, everything's focused on the future. And the fact is almost none of these kids are even going to play college hockey, let alone the NHL. And that's just a fact. And, but this is their hockey career right now and they're missing it. And they're, well, their parents are missing it because they're so focused on next year and things are weird things. Things have huge unintended consequences. So when I was growing up, we'd had our tryouts in the fall and then you'd try out for your team and then you'd go play. Then when I, I go away and I live my life, I come back out here, I see youth hockey again. The tryouts are now in the spring, okay? And they say the tryouts are in the spring because that's when the kids are going at their best and they're all in shape. But they're really in the spring because all these different hockey programs are competing with each other and want to lock these kids up before they go to a different hockey program. But the result is the tryouts are right after the state championship. So the best thing is when the team starts really working together and the kids start playing like a team, it's like the most magical thing you've ever seen. It makes you so happy. But then suddenly about three weeks before the season ends, everybody starts to focus on the tryouts coming up. And then it's like the team sort of starts to pull apart and it's every man for himself again. And it's sort of, sort of sad, you know? So that has been, I think, a really tough thing on these teams, which is the importance always of the tryout and the judgment. There's a question, would you do it all over again? I'm still doing it. <laughs> I mean, I don't have to do it all over again. Mike is still playing right in the middle of his hockey career, you know? So I always say if you, something you like, uh, don't like in the book to any of his coaches or anything, uh, just remember the children are not responsible for the sins of the parents. And um, also I said, when this book was coming out, I said to Mike, I hope no one gets pissed off. I hope that this doesn't mess up your hockey career. This is why he's a better person than me. And he said, look, let's be honest that I don't have much of a hockey career anyway. It's not that big a deal. <laughs> <laughs> I love that he loves it so much. That's really my, my big takeaway from the book that even after the worst game and these, all these situations, he's like, I just love hockey. Well, That's the amazing. thing is like, we have completely different personalities. Like I grew, I was uh, a kind of, I feel like I played hockey angry and I wouldn't necessarily say I was ever happy. I was angry. I felt like somebody was treating me unfairly. That's probably still my problem, you know? And, um, and I thought that hockey was a game to play while well, you have to play with a lot of anger. And I used to tell him that, like, this is a kind of, you have to get worked up here. You have to get emotional and get a little bit angry. And he never, ever did. And that's, that gives him the ability to, have, to play for a long time and not get bored and to always love it. And his thing is, it is, it's like pizza. Like, there's no bad pizza, really. I mean, there's great pizza and there's kind of cold pizza, but all pizza is good. Same with him in hockey. There's really no bad hockey. He's just excited to be out there. even playing and the funny thing for parents is you think about all this stuff with your kids but if you ask my kid what's the best part about hockey he's going to say the holiday and breakfast buffet i mean that's the funnest part for them it's staying in hotels with their friends and running around the halls yeah. eating the buffet that's what they're going to remember that's awesome do you see the question from kelly how do you keep perspective on all the parents around you are hitting the critical mass of that mindset of spending money on extra tra training camp coaching how do you keep the kids having fun and not getting caught up I think kids mostly have the ability to tune out their parents. I honestly, I think that they're really much stronger than you give them credit for. And when you leave them alone and let them play, they actually play well, mostly well together. So, but there's a certain amount of tension and stress that you can't get rid of. And that's probably to some extent, it's good because they're going to have to deal with it all their lives. And they learn to deal with it in a very controlled thing. I mean, one of the great things to me was we, we had a team, another team that went on these huge losing streaks. And a lot of the parents were upset because they wanted these kids to win. But by the end of the year, they got good. You realize the losing was the best thing for them. Like they had to lose to learn how to win. You, it's true. You really don't learn anything from winning. You learn from losing. And the losing made these kids real, think about what they loved about hockey, look at the game in a different way, and come out as much better players from losing. Um, one thing in the book, um, talking about uh, winning or losing, there's a, a part in the book where you talk about the parent meetings, which I'm sure everyone who's listening has been to a parent meeting. 
a team meeting before the season starts and they ask you to rank uh, what's most important, learning to play hockey, winning, having fun, and they say there's no right answer. And then, they, and then what do they proceed to tell you? Well, they tell you your answer is wrong. So it's <laughs> one of those things where there's no right answer, but your answer is wrong. You know, and that was a really funny thing because I got an early look into this team because one of the things was where do you rank winning? And the guy explained that, you know, winning's last. Like winning comes after fun, teamwork, character building, learning the game. And the, the, guy, the, the guy, the parent got really mad is like, well, if they're losing all the time, they're not going to have fun. They're not going to, you know, it's like a whole thing, a whole philosophical argument. And the guy's saying, look, if they have teamwork, they have all these things, then they will win. You know, it's not something to have as a goal. It's something that happens as a result of everything else that you do. And, and if you do everything right, it will work itself out, which I found to be true, you know? Um, but it was like right at the beginning, you realize you're dealing with, you know, people with different philosophies and, you know, there's this attitude that everything's soft now and every, you know, these kids play really, really hard and they work really, really hard, much harder than they did when I was a kid. So um, you got to cut them some slack sometimes, you know? Uh, the last question is from Finley. Uh, Rich, as hockey parents of two boys, one in high school and one in college, but both aging out rapidly, what do you do after youth hockey, after, after you've read your book many times? In my opinion, nothing even comes close. Well, that's a thing that I look at. I, I had this realization like last year looking at some of the parents, which is like, this is their life, you know? And I feel the same way, you know, this is your life. Like, you get, this is the structure of your life that carries you through the winter time, you know, and, and it becomes so important. And then suddenly it's just going to end and you're going to, and, and how, how are these people emotionally going to deal with it? You know? And I don't know. I think the answer is probably gardening or golf. That's all I can think of, you know, or, or maybe just be a weird adult who hangs around the rink watching other people's kids. Those are about <laughs> your only options. Oh I my God, that's so great. Uh, Steve Stanton, who I think I know Steve Stanton, to what extent is club hockey hurting high school or high school teams, do you think? Um, what do you mean? Like the, uh, oh, because, because the people play for the, those teams. Travel instead hockey of the, instead of the high school. Well, it's funny because, yeah, definitely I'm sure it hurts. I haven't seen it as a parent, but I know that I played on, my brother and I played in a very good hockey organization in Illinois called Deerfield. And I was looking through this list of, players that played there that went to the NHL and there was a pretty long list and then suddenly it ended uh, like in the mid eighties, it seemed like it ended and that's because triple a hockey really took off. And suddenly you realized that people were not playing for these teams anymore. And that's one of the bad things I think in a way, I mean, part, part of the problem with the high school hockey is it's not enough games. You play so many more games in these organizations. So that's a big thing, but, and some kids find a way to play for both. But I do think that as things get more and more professional, people want better and better organizations and they're, they're, it takes it away from the high school. Um, when I was a kid, we had a house league and the house league was really, really good. And some of the best kids played in the house league simply because their parents didn't want to pay for travel hockey or had 12 kids and didn't have time to drive anywhere. So they put them in the house league and those kids would then show up at the high school and be the best players and you didn't even know about them because they've been playing house league. And now it's like everything is, you got to be at the top. You got to be at the best. And, and um, that just sucks everything to these higher and higher organizations. And then in the end, we all become like tennis parents. You know, we're all going to be sending our kids to the IMG Academy to uh, become, you know, these incredible athletes. <laughs> what do you, uh, so um, I wanted to ask you, um, th this, this book is, is, a, is a year and the ups and the downs. So what is uh, Micah doing now? And what did he think of the book? Well, he's only read parts of the book, okay? I mean, and he hasn't, we, we listened to him. There's an audio book. And he, only one thing really bugged him in the book, okay. I'll say. And that is when I said that Micah, and it's right at the beginning, Micah is a peewee that could pass for sport. Okay, but that's just the Look fact. Look at the size. The size, small. Yeah. I was small. And the fact is that you have this tremendous, this is an age where some kids have gone through puberty and some haven't. So it's like you have this huge dis uh, discrepancy. And I mean, I talk way too much about this stuff, but I'm always like, look, it's good because the really great parent, the really great players grew late because they have to figure out a way to be effective when you're, there's players way bigger than you can never, and then you will grow and you will play like a small player, but be a big player. I was, you know, I always see sort of the positive in it. Um, so now he's, he's a bantam. 
So this is a few years ago this season, and he's playing in Brewster, which is just about the same distance from us on the other side, which has great hockey. So we are, we are still on the train. So you wrote a book about the Chicago Bears, a great book called Monsters. How did covering the pros or writing about professional athletes, NFL players, compare to writing about your neighbors and your teammates, parents, and, and these athletes who are playing for the love of the game or playing because their parents or coaches want them to play? Um, well, I'll tell you that I think youth sports is so great to write about because it is the most pure form of sports. These are kids that are playing because they really love to play. They're not getting obviously paid. It's not professional. They're kids. But when, they, when, they're, when they're actually – and that, a great thing about hockey is, like, if you watch kids who are seven and eight play baseball, it's very boring. I don't know if you've ever done it. When you watch them play football, it's very boring. And it's an unrecognizable from what the sport will become five, six years later. Ho- youth hockey, it's still hockey. I mean, it still looks like hockey. It's slower and they're smaller. And you could, I would go to those tournaments and wa- sit there and I get really into games that I had nothing to do with, you know? So it, as a sport, it's great and it's exciting and it's kind of the purest form of sport. I will tell you, there was one thing I always had in mind, which was my first job out of college was I was a messenger at the New Yorker magazine and I had nothing to do. And I'd go back and read the old issues. And Stephen King, a lot of people don't know this, wrote a reported story nonfiction about his son's little league baseball team oh. in Maine. And he, and he just wrote about it almost like he's just a sports writer. And it was so interesting to me because you got completely into this team, you know, even though, why do you care? But yet you did because it is very pure sports. So I always thought that it was kind of, I always had this dream of writing about all four major sports. I wrote a book about the Cubs and the Bears. And hockey, a great way to do it seemed to be right about hockey at its most formative moment, which is 12-year-olds, 11-year-olds. So Mikhail said, what's your next book? That's her question. Um, I don't know. If you have any <laughs> ideas, just write them there in the chat. Well, this has been such a treat. Rich Cohen, thank you so much. Our neighbor, Deb Placey, we really appreciate your time. And it's just so much fun. The book was great. Do, can, do we know what ever happened to Coach Pete, why he didn't show up at that game? I know everything. <laughs> okay. There's a, there's, a, there's, a, there's, a, there's a great blues song that goes, you can, you can get me talking, but I won't tell you everything I know. Okay. <laughs> we'll save it for another time. And I just want to thank our audience. And uh, we've got a couple of amazing Meet the Author meetings coming up this Thursday. We have chess master Daniel Lowinger. On February 11th, we have best-selling author Nina Sankovic. And on February 18th, we have Pulitzer Prize winner Ayad Akhtar. So tune in to PequotLibrary.org for upcoming programs. And again, on behalf of Pequot Library, Rich Cohen and Deb Placey, this has been amazing. Have a great night and hope to see you all again. Thanks, Deb. Thank you so much. It was fun, everybody. Thank you all.